Hello, and welcome to This Week in Sociological Perspective. I'm your host, Samuel Roundfield Lucas. This week, we discuss the removal of the allegedly last public payphone in New York. But first, I recently spoke with Professor Emily Rauscher of Brown University about her recent paper titled, Learning to Value Girls, Balanced Infant Sex Ratios at Higher Parental Education in the United States, 1969 to 2018. The paper is to be published in Demography and is co-authored by Hao Ming Song. Professor Rauscher, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you, your paper studies sex ratios of live births and of children in the United States, young children. So there's a lot of research on sex ratios outside the U.S. What motivates your study of the sex ratio in the U.S.? Great. Well, one reason is that uh, in developed countries like the U.S., we might think that we have kind of already reached gender equality, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with the gender revolution. And um, this study um, looks at variation in sex, infant sex ratios uh, by ethnicity, by race and ethnicity, and by maternal education. And the, um, you know, partly it's to see whether and where kind of the gender revolution has stalled and how that differs by education um, and by race and ethnic group or background. And um, relate, you know, kind of a, where my, the reason that I got to this question is that I study social returns or social benefits of education. There's a lot of work that looks at the individual level benefits of education, especially in terms of economic returns. And, um, if we just focus on those individual level benefits or even just on economic returns, we're missing a lot of the potential benefits of education for groups and, um, you know, for society and including potential benefits for equality. Um, both, you know, most of my work looks at, um, implications for equality by class and by race. And this expands that to look at implications by gender. Okay, so the, in the past, uh, if you wanted a child of one or the other sex, you could, you know, just kill the newborn whose sex you didn't want. But in places like the US where most births occur in hospitals, is this, even possible, and if, if it's not, or common, certainly, uh, how would there be a different sex ratio produced if the opportunity to, to act is so much reduced compared to, you know, the past? And in, in places where, the, where the, um, the way in which births occur, you know, home births and maybe not always registered and so forth is so different. Yes, so that's a great question. Um, the knowledge about um, prenatal infant sex, you know, there was a lot of kind of folk knowledge and, you know, women would say, oh, you're carrying this way, so it's likely a boy or vice versa, but we couldn't know for sure um, until technology advanced, including um, widespread access to ultrasound technology and that um, became more widely available or became widely available in the US in the 1970s and 80s. And um, now uh, women who are pregnant, they can you know, readily learn the sex of the infant even as early as 10 weeks uh, through genetic testing and um, women and partners in general, they can uh, 
use sex selective technologies to determine uh, what sex the infant will be, including, you know, sex selective abortion, but also um, in vitro fertilization and sperm sorting to, you know, care, <laughs> Uh, have a, a heavy hand in um, influencing what, you know, whether they get a boy or a girl? Well, um, theoretically, so assuming someone with, with these technologies that you've identified, people can act on a preference to obtain, you know, uh, as you said, use the heavy hand of human desire to push one, uh, make sure they're getting one sex versus the other. Uh, or another, what factors might push sex ratios at the societal level or or at the individual level, push people to want to have a preference one way or the other or to act in one way or the other? What kinds of factors might play a role? Great, so that gets right at the heart of this, of our paper. Um, one key factor is kind of traditional preferences, cultural preferences for uh, boys versus girls children and um, the one that people may know of most widely is the you know how the family name gets tends to be passed down along the male side and so um, you know if women change their names when they change their name when they get married um, then that is an example of a strong um, cultural preference for boy children. Um, and now with more equal access to economic resources, and especially in more developed countries, the, that preference may be trending to be a bit weaker. So these kind of traditional gender preferences. Um, but there are still obvious um, kind of cultural norms in place, like this name, last name uh, tradition. Um, so that's one key reason. Um, that's, I would say the most um, widely recognized and um, probably the largest factor. So would that push the ratios for toward more boys or toward more girls? Yes, so that would, push the ratios toward more boys at the aggregate level. So, and again, I just want to, um, you know, state that this is not every uh, couple by any means. This is just, um, you know, when we look at the aggregate, the group as a whole, then we start to see some patterns um, and potential changes over time and by education. And so basically if traditional uh, cultural preferences are stronger, then we might expect to see more males born than females born. Okay. So what, uh, when you, you looked at it, so how did you break it out? And then what were the key findings? Great. Um, so we looked at, um, we examined infant sex ratios by maternal race and ethnicity and by year of infant birth and most importantly by maternal education. Um, and so we looked at how this measure of male bias um, or male preference or gender status inequality, how that changed over time, how it differed by uh, maternal race and ethnicity, and also by maternal education. And um, we, so I'm trying to think of the second part of your question. Oh, <laughs> um, so we traced within group over time since the 1970s, uh, and also within group by maternal education. And um, so the, if, if we expect that maternal education will just increase access to resources and allow people to act on um, 
you know, traditional preference for male children, then we might expect to see more male biased sex ratios at higher levels of education. Alternatively, if uh, we ex if we think that people may gain more egalitarian views with higher levels of education, then we would expect to see less biased infant sex ratios, so more equal infant sex ratios at birth. And um, Sam, did you ask about the finding? Yes, yes. Okay, yes, great. So, so, <laughs> so the key uh, finding is greater equality of infant sex ratios with higher education. And uh, so to give an example, the male to female ratio at birth is about six percentage points lower among Chinese mothers with a college degree compared to those with no college. And um, that amounts to almost 2,900 additional girl babies in over our whole study period, just on average. Um, and the... So, so just to make sure I'm following. So yes. what that finding is saying is that if you take uh, women from that racial or that nationality who are uh, less, who have less education, there's uh, some evidence of a preference for boys. But when you uh, take people from the same nationality with more education, that preference is at least reduced, if not eliminated. Yes, and in fact, um, the reason I wanted to ask is because it could be it could be the other way that you know there's a preference for girls in the higher education, and then that gets uh, uh, reduced. You know, it's in other words, since it's sort of like a, a teeter totter, it could you know it could go. But what it really is is there's no situ none of them are showing a preference for girls. It's just that the preference for boys are is declining to equality. It does seem like that. Yes, and. Um, it seems to be that a college degree is the key here because when mothers have a college degree, we're, for almost every single group, we're at you know, e equality or the, um, the norm, which is always a tiny, you know, slightly more boy infants are boy, born than girls. And that's um, evolutionary. <laughs> um, evolutionarily determined or an outcome just across humans. <laughs> um, and, but when, when mothers have a college degree, that is, it's about equal for, for all groups, so. So when you say equal, so this one, it's like 104 boys per 100 girls is something like that? Yeah, about that, like 106 for every 100 oh. girls, yeah. So when you say equality, I was assuming you meant it was down to the 106 to 100 ratio, and yeah, a, which is sort of a biological, which yeah. there may be some biological explanations for this. I, I don't know if that ratio lasts very long. I don't know if boys are more likely to, uh, if boys and girls are equally likely to survive infancy or if there's a decline or something like that. But, but at least what we're talking is that the biological pattern is what it was. It's not adjusted by human behaviors like selective uh, uh, sex selection of, of in vitro fertilization, things like that. That's right, that's what it seems like. Um, one key thing to note here is that male fetuses are uh, a bit more sensitive to environmental uh, shocks or negative environmental exposures. And so, um, you know, as pollution increases and wildfires and, um, you know, lots more environmental stressors, uh, I would expect to see, and I think environmental sociologists have found or demographers have found that the sex ratio can decline with those, high, with increasing environmental pollution and negative um, influences. Okay. So this education effect is, it turns out it sounds like it's more equalizing than uh, 
which he explains it's more not it's the people's uh, embrace of more egalitarian is more the dominant th- effect, dominant pattern, not the uh, more resources mean they will act on the previous preferences. Exactly, yes. So it seems that um, uh, with higher education, um, there tends to be more equal sex ratios, which is, trad- which is consistent with this um, idea that uh, people seem to gain more egalitarian views with higher education. Was there any time trend? Uh, was it getting more equal over time or, or more unequal over time? In the, um, you, you covered the late 60s to the, to the 2000, 2018 or something. Exactly, yes. And um, I, I'm trying to, I, I believe the kind of the overall trend was toward more uh, equality anyway, which is consistent with uh, expansion of higher education across the board. Um, but there was there was some variation by uh, ethnic background. Okay. So what? So this is a is what do we take from from this by these findings? Is uh, you know what does this say about uh, society or or the questions that motivated your interest in this in this question in the U.S. context? That's great. Um, For me, I take from it that uh, we we gain a lot of social benefits from education, including in this case, more equality of um, gender status uh, within groups and that, um, you know, investing in education has benefits for the group as well as the individual. Um, so I guess the overall the key takeaway is that higher education is related to more equal gender status in the U.S. Do are there any um, as an indicator of gender of the status of uh, whether there's equality or inequality or uh, you know sex ratio is uh, uh, that's uh, interesting and kind of embedded in the behaviors that people are going to do, uh, index. But should we care about the sex ratio for any other? I mean, yes, that's a nice measure of quality, equality or inequality. But, you know, does it really matter? I um, mean, maybe it does, a, but I have no idea. I'm not a, I'm not a demographer. I don't know anybody. So, yeah, um, so that's a great um, question. There's this excellent book called Too Many Women by... Gutentag and Sikor, <clears throat> and they, <clears throat> excuse me, they argue that a whole host of um, kind of social factors follow from the sex ratio, um, especially among young adults when people are looking for a partner, <clears throat> including, um, you know, things like um, uprisings or um social movements and also um, art and cultural preference, cultural change. And um, so from, if their argument is valid, (laughs) then which um, they, I think they do a good job backing it up. They draw on a lot of historical data, including, looking at cohorts that were influenced by war and, um, and things like that. Um, and so if, if we believe their argument, then there are many, many potential um, consequences of unbalanced sex ratios. And if we don't have to just take their argument, <laughs> if we look in, um, in China, for example, where there have been um, multiple cohorts with, uh, you know, unbalanced sex ratios. We can see struggles with um, finding partner marriage partners and um, and things like that. 
So it's an interesting title, Too Many Women, because the paper and the historical, if I'm understanding correctly, the historical mm -hmm. uh, tendency is for male sex preference. So wouldn't that mean you too many men? So I'm wondering when they were, I mean, you know, it's just the title of a book that's not a good indicator of everything that's in there. But I'm wondering were there symmetric effects of you know, do you have the same effect on a society if there are alleged, you know, by these, the sex ratio is skewed toward more women. I don't want to say too many women, too many mm -hmm. men, because that implies I have an idea of how, what the perfect number would be, which I don't, but, <laughs> but, but we can certainly say if there are more men than women, do you get the same, do we anticipate the same impacts on society as we would if you have more women than men? And, you know, this is not, I know your paper wasn't on this, but hey, you're, you're a scholar and you've thought, you've thought, you've definitely thought about these kinds of issues more than I. So if you have anything to say that I would love to hear. Um, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I guess, I mean, it all hinges on the, what, the gender roles and the normative um, roles and behaviors of by gender, but so I'm trying to recall their argument. I believe that it can shape um, how it can shape um, how society views the role of women in particular. So if they're rare, then it makes it more likely that women will be enamored and placed on a pedestal and placed in very traditional roles. Um, and so by that um, kind of, by that reasoning, more having unbalanced ratios in favor of more men could perpetuate the problem and make it even worse um, wow. with having this kind of even more traditional views about women. So you could see how it could get into a cyclical pattern. Yeah, a self-reinforcing dynamic. Exactly, uh, wow. yes. And, but in the contra, in the other hand, if there are too, you know, too many women, as the book is titled, um, then women are more likely to be, you think of, you know, during World War II, they're more likely to be in all kinds of, roles and it can lead to greater equality and um, changes along that line. But I see how what you're saying, it, it does hinge greatly on what the roles, how, how rigid those roles were conceived at, at the outset. Um, that's right. How, which way, you know, but that's very interesting. Well, um, do, if we take this back as a indicator of gender equality or inequality, um, does your analysis, given your, your analysis, you said something like, it looks like things are moving in, a, they're more equal than you might have otherwise thought on other indices. Um, is, is there a message for people, politicians, policymakers around that comes out of this, uh, out of your reflection on the implications of the fight? Uh, so from my perspective, uh, it suggests that investing in education is beneficial. Uh, it can, in addition to all the other benefits that we know about, it seems that it can help to spread this more egalitarian uh, view um, of, you know, in this case, preferences for um, child sex. Professor Rauscher, I want to thank you for uh, uh, this work. When when I looked at your paper, I was uh, I was surprised because I'd never thought about this kind of question in the U.S. context, and I think it's uh, illuminating. How you shed a lot of light on uh, an issue that uh, definitely bears attention, and I appreciate your coming on and bringing your uh, insights, uh, sharing them with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. So I guess the takeaway is 
invest in education for more equality. <laughs> That's uh, thank you very much. Our final segment concerns reports of the removal of the last public telephone in New York City. On May 24th, NPR Morning Edition reported that, quote, the days of fishing through your pockets for change to make a phone call are officially over in New York City. Yesterday in Manhattan, crews removed the last functioning public payphone, which was on 7th Avenue in Midtown. The city has gradually been replacing payphones with public Wi-Fi hotspots where people can hop online and even charge a cell phone. It may be weird to say, not so fast, about a technology in use since 1888, but a few days after the NPR story, other news outlets, including the New Yorker on May 28th and the New York Times on June 1st, reported that there were still a few dozen public payphones in New York. While the existence of only one payphone means the technology is still around, the falling numbers of payphones in New York City are clear, and they reflect a nationwide decline in the availability of payphones. According to Jessa Lingell, the number of payphones in the U.S. peaked at 2.6 million in 1995, and according to the FCC, usage peaked in 1999 when there were still about 2.1 million installed payphones. However, Lingle reports by 2018, there were only about 100,000 payphones nationwide. As the NPR article indicated, or report indicated, in New York, the city is replacing payphones with public Wi-Fi hotspots. The assumption is that people can use cell phones to not only replace the functions of the payphone, but actually transcend them. And clearly, many more people can do that than in the past because cell phone availability has surged. The Pew Research Center reports that as of February 2021, 85% of U.S. adults own a smartphone and 97% of Americans own some kind of cell phone. Sociologists have long established that people with less money, less education, or living in smaller communities tend to adopt new technology later than do their wealthier, more educated, or more urban counterparts. And one reason could be that often it takes a little longer to roll out technology to rural areas, or it may be that uh, people are reluctant to use it, the technology because in their community it's not used very often. Or if it's an issue of uh, the technology being expensive, clearly people with more money are more likely to have the means to obtain that technology earlier than people who do not have as much money. And then the last thing to say is that often the technology, when it first rolls out, is very expensive. And as it becomes more used and it becomes uh, uh, more widely, um, uh, the manufacturing processes uh, extend and get more developed, uh, prices come down, and then it becomes possible for people with uh, less money to, to obtain the technology. So for all these reasons and others, we expect that people with less money, less education, or living in smaller communities might be less likely to have technology like cell phones or more uh, recent technology. But our expectations are wrong. The Pew Research Center shows that while 98% of city residents have a cell phone, 94% of rural residents have a cell phone. Now that's a difference, but it's an incredibly small difference. And while 98% of college graduates have a cell phone, 96% of those who went no further than high school do as well. Income differences are also minimal. 97% of those earning less than $30,000 a year have a cell phone, while the statistics show that virtually 100% of those earning $75,000 or more have a cell phone. While there are some differences in smartphone ownership, it appears that cell phones have been around so long, and the numbers of people with them are now so high, that mere possession of the device no longer differs by these historic dimensions of inequality. So, if upwards of 95% or more of the people have cell phones, and if cell phones can replace the function of payphones, does the removal of payphones matter? Well, there are three questions there, but I want to focus on two. First, do cell phones replace the function of payphones? 
Well, we know that both devices can make calls. An advantage of the cell phones is that wherever you need them to be, they can be there. As long as there's a cell tower or some means to connect to the network, you, your cell phone will work. And so you can have it in your pocket. You don't have to get to the location of a payphone. So that's, that's a potential advantage. And another advantage of the cell phone is that it can be personalized. You don't have to remember someone's number. You can just record it, uh, have it stored on your phone, and one touch of a button, and you can connect to that person. So those are some advantages of the cell phone technology. But payphones aren't without advantages. The call quality of a payphone can be more consistent because landlines are, you know, a, line, a wired system is often more reliable than a system through the airwaves. Payphone calls and landline calls to 911 automatically give time-saving information to the dispatcher, the location from which the call is coming, whereas cell phones are spotty at best in, in doing that. And another advantage of payphones is that they are more reliable in regional or national emergencies. Uh, partially because of the technology, the electric system, uh, basically the cell phones don't need the electric system to be up because they get their technology in a more passive way. They get their electricity in a more passive way. So what we can say is that day to day, cell phones do replace payphone functions and even transcend them. But in emergencies, cell phones fall short. Even if someday cell phones fully replace payphones functions, we can also ask, does the removal of payphones matter? When maintained, payphones are a collective good. For one, they don't cost much to use. Indeed, calls to 911 are free, and one can make collect calls so that you, the, even those calls can be free. And the cost, even if, if you have to pay, is low and on a per-use basis. There's no need to pay $50 a month or so just for the opportunity to maybe make a call or maybe not make a call. Another uh, important thing to note is that the payphone network makes phones available for anyone to use, whether they knew they wanted to use them when they left home or not. Removing payphones, even if you replace them with public Wi-Fi, is to go all in on privatization. It's true that public Wi-Fi is a public resource, but to access it, you need to own or have access to the private technology, such as a cell phone or a smartphone. And there are many reasons someone might lack such a device. They may just be in the 3% of people who don't have a cell phone, or they may have left it at home by mistake and now they find they need it. Or they may have bought their device, but mistakenly left it somewhere or had it stolen. They could even be a visitor from overseas and thus have a cell phone plan that's too expensive to use while traveling. Now we can ask, are these costs of replacing payphones with Wi-Fi hotspots prohibitive? That's a judgment for voters and residents to make. My point is simply that there are costs to the change. Now, this is a very different matter than when payphones were invented and rolled out across the country. Professor Lingell noted that in 1880, the inventor of the payphone, William Gray, was inspired to develop a way to collect coins for purchase of time for a call by the course of his second wife's pregnancy. Apparently, his first wife had died in childbirth. When his second wife encountered complications one evening, he left home and headed to a nearby factory, a business that had a phone. With some effort, he was able to overcome the reluctance of those on duty and they let him use the phone to call a doctor. The story has a happy ending. His wife was treated and they welcomed a new addition to the household. But William Gray was not satisfied with just a new baby. He sought yet another addition. Consequently, he responded to the difficulties by, over the next eight years, tinkering his way to a new invention, the pay telephone. At that point, he patented his invention his contribution to the world, reaping personal rewards for that contribution for decades after, and equalizing and broadening telecommunication access for hundreds of millions and perhaps billions of people. For use in good times and bad, for use in normal times and emergency ones, ubiquitous access to the pay telephone was a reliable, cheap, socially empowering public good. About the pay telephone's replacement technology, 
for all its convenience and LOLs and emojis, we cannot yet say the same. That's This Week in Sociological Perspective. We'll be back next week with another interview with an author of some important sociological research and more sociological insights on an issue in the news. Till then, take care.